Hello, <clears throat> and welcome to Traeger Method Oil Painting, Episode 14. Using a popsicle stick here to uh, paint in prison bars on this uh, portal. I was looking around for a straight edge. I have a couple pieces of foam core I sometimes use. Then I wanted something smaller and I, I looked over at my palette and there was a popsicle stick that I had left there after eating a creamsicle. I laughed because I was looking around for something exactly like it and there it was. By not being efficient, by not throwing away my popsicle stick in a timely fashion, I'd given myself the perfect tool to paint in some prison bars. The lesson? Be a complete slob. Be disorganized. Be chaotic, and everything will work out. <laughs> See, I did that one without the stick, and it's messed up looking. But then you add in that next one, and the eye kind of corrects it and goes, eh, it's not that bad. Actually, that bugs the shit out of me how out of whack that one is. But whatever. <clears throat> They're just prison bars. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to hold the prisoner inside. Putting in shadows. When doing a shadow, one good uh, rule of thumb is to use the complementary color of the thing that's casting the shadow. So if it's a lemon that's yellow, have the shadow have a little purple tint to it. If it's a blue, you know, these bars here are very dark colored but they are bluish. So I made the uh, shadow have a slight orange tint. Pretty much always looks decent when you do that. I've been adding prison bars to a lot of my portals as I move towards finishing these paintings, I got a lot of them now that are at the 95% done stage. And often that last 5% involves, of fin towards finishing, involves fine detail work and glazing. I've really been feeling the prison bars, the uh, iron bars, because reality has had a uh, claustrophobic feeling lately. 
That's one of the elements. Captured in the culture. Imprisoned in the mind by disease. Pandemic been left to run wild in this country by incompetence, greed, idiocy. I've been experiencing a very distinctive pattern of uh, one day I'll be completely racked with anxiety, fear, anger, rage, despair, and then the next day I will feel relief. I'll feel more hopeful, more centered. Maybe not hopeful, but uh, I feel more in the moment, calm, accepting, determined, a little more of a sense of humor. And it seems to be a every other day on off kind of uh, cycle. You know, there's this unbearable tension. If you, if you pay attention to anything, there's an unbearable tension in the United States, I mean, Portland especially, but in the United States in general, heading towards an election fiasco, catastrophe. It seems baked into it that it will be a catastrophe no matter what happens. I mean, I can't see any scenario where this criminal regime will relinquish power you know, in on any way. I just don't see it. And then if you follow the news of, you know, the deluded propagandized masses, the uh, cult followers of various stripes. You know, and you understand that there is a uh, substantial minority within the country who live in a completely alternate universe to anything based in facts or observable reality you know when you understand this you just think well this also isn't a, a thing that's going away at any time it's not a thing that's uh, um, there's no end point to it this is the world we live in this is the internet world you know this isn't the now, this isn't a, a Trump world. This is the internet world. This is the social media, the YouTube world. I mean, we've always lived in alternate realities. It's just that now we have these uh, you know, feedback loop systems, these closed loops of uh, information that drive us insane. I mean, I think about my own difficulty managing the stream of electronic information, electronically delivered information in my own life. And I'm a, a, a media savvy person. a well-read, well, you know, I've, I've been paying attention my entire life and been an analyzing systems of power, systems of persuasion, you know, all my life. And I still find it incredibly difficult to navigate mentally, spiritually, intellectually, 
the stream of information and images that comes at me on a daily basis. And I think anyone who says they're not overwhelmed by it is, is lying. Um, and so then it gives me compassion for these people who are taken in by these outlandish conspiracy theories and things of that nature. Because I think, well, let's say you're not particularly sharp. You're not particularly stable. You're unable to to process and discern between objective truth and nonsense. I mean, you know, it's understandable. I, I just don't think we're equipped. I think people, you know, we, we, we human beings evolved over you know, hundreds of thousands of years, homo sapiens. You know, to live in villages, tribes, communities, small groups of people, relatively speaking, to deal with information about your community, things going on, the weather, what, what not. And then, you know, to put these, you know, us in this situation where we're just bombarded by this addictive flow. I mean, it's just, you can't make this stuff up. It's, it's so intense and so over the top. So total. You know, you can't, we're not equipped to deal with it. We're just not able to, we're not equipped to. You know, and here I am on YouTube, creating a video for YouTube. The very service I'm talking about. Part of the reason I think it's important to produce and release content that is, for lack of a better word, boring, <laughs> you know, not hyper stimulating. I mean, YouTube, you know, it's the typical YouTube video that has any kind of success is somebody screaming at you about nonsense and thousand quick edits and all this, you know. You know what a YouTube video looks like. Hey guys, what's up? Blah blah blah. You know, here's me blah, in your face. Blah, blah, blah. Quick edit joke. Quite crazy face. Back to that. Back to this. Blah, 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 blah. You know, that's what people respond to. You know, it's the only way to compete. Oil painting is a slow process. Building a following. I mean, if, if that's what I'm even doing, I have no, I have no intentions with this. I have no, you know, this is just self-expression. I mean, just the fact that I make these videos a half hour long, and that I, or, or you know, approximately maybe sometimes an hour, but you know. The fact that I speed up the footage, in this case it's you know, double time, that right there is me capitulating to the marketplace. You know, I, should, I should do one of these where I slow it down and make it five hours long, impossible to watch. Like, why not?
One thing that has become apparent to me in the past, uh, I don't know, few weeks, as I've tried to manage and maintain my equilibrium, I've noticed the healing and therapeutic value of creativity, of creative action, of making art <clears throat> more profoundly, I think, than ever before in my life. You know, I've always kind of laughed at the idea that like art saves lives, art you know matters because you know everything in the culture tells you art does not matter. It's not important. It's just something for rich people, made by privileged people for privileged people. Blah blah blah, and it's all just crap and it's a joke and who cares and it's not honored, it's not funded. And you know, as an artist, you, you take that, you know, you hear that everywhere and you, you see it and you understand it. And it gets to you, you know. But, uh, you know, I've always maintained in my own mind and my own understanding that, you know, art is the, it's, it's the essential human activity. Self-expression makes life, it, it, you know, life is meaningless without us creating meaning. It's not inherently meaningful. It has no meaning. Unless you make meaning. Art is my way of making meaning. The activity of art making is therapeutic. On the deepest level, I was I was talking to a friend the other day, and I, it occurred to me as I was talking to him that my perception of the world outside my door is that things get worse and worse and worse, and I can only see them getting worse much of the time generally speaking, just worse and worse. I think a big part of this is <clears throat> climate chaos, climate catastrophe, the impending, the, not impending, it's happening, the, the collapse of our ecosystem, of our, the natural world, it's happening in real time. You know, that's the ultimate, things are getting worse <laughs> data. And will only continue to get worse. And, uh, and by worse, I just mean, you know, for human, for mammal life on Earth. Obviously, <clears throat> life will go on on Earth <clears throat> without us. But uh, it's hard not to be self-centered as a species, you know, when, when thinking about the species. Concerned about our future. I don't know why. That is. <clears throat> Painting a little figure in there. This detail looks really bad to me right now. It looks so so sloppy and terrible. I've never been able to enjoy the leaves in this painting. It's been more like a uh, just an experiment. How do you paint leaves? You know, what's the what's the what's the uh, the method for these stylized leaves? I'm just learning all the time. But anyways, um, what I was talking about. Um, yeah, the, the, the outside world, you know, it just seems like, oh, you know, fascism is just going to always be, you know, as things just get more and more intense, they're, they're, they're going to get more and more fascistic and chaotic and lifespans will, you know, the, the, will decrease and pain will be more widespread and systems will collapse and chaos will ensue as we tumble off the climate cliff. With the unrest in Portland, you know, I, I just am, you know, one of the painful things about having a very good, well-honed imagination is you can just go deep into any scenario you want to imagine. Yeah, this pitched 
battle between most of the citizens of the city and the police. You know, where does that end? What, what's what's the what's the goal? What what will it look like? You know, who knows? It just seems inevitable that right wing fanatics will descend on Portland. It's such a focus point nationally. Just feels like that's inevitable. This feeling that the world's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Would be excruciating, unbearable, really, if it wasn't for art. That's the point I'm, I'm getting at. Because the experience I've been having in the studio, working on this you know, massive group of paintings I'm working on, is that every day I work on them, every hour, every minute I put into them, the paintings get better. They improve. I enjoy them more. I feel more satisfaction. I feel more accomplishment. I feel more hope that I could sell them and make, you know, support myself. I feel more confident that someone will find meaning in them, joy, pleasure, uh, mystery. The more effort I put in. And it seems to be, it's like a mirror image of this hopeless a place that I can go to really easily about the world outside the door. And that drives me to dedicate myself with more fervor, with more energy to this process of uh, creativity and to focus on you know, all, other art too, but mostly this, um, these paintings. I feel very intensely and viscerally that art saves lives. I, no, I don't feel it, I experience it. I experience that. Art saves my life on a daily basis. My quality of life is completely dependent on <clears throat> creating. And I want more people to be able to experience that and to have that. I mean, I've had so much support throughout my life from family, friends, on this path, you know, I think, and just also the privilege of just being a white person in America, you know, how much easier it is to do everything. You know, my family was not wealthy, but, you know, middle class white people are now like a wealthy, that would be considered a wealthy group. I mean, the way we lived in I mean, in the, the year I was born, 1968, the minimum wage, this, I, I read this and this blew my mind. Well, it didn't blow my mind, it just, it, it just made, it, it put things into context in a way that I hadn't understood fully. In 1968, the year I was born, the minimum wage had the spending power, the equivalent spending power of $36 an hour. So if you worked at a grocery store or something like that, you could buy a house, raise a family. And that's 1968. That's a year that the, that the country was falling apart. I mean, absolutely falling apart. Probably the last period that felt like we do now.
And that alone makes me think, wow, it must be so much worse now than it was then. Like, because the minimum wage today, federal minimum wage, I don't know exactly what it is, but something like seven twenty-five an hour or something like that. Which would allow you at full time, 40 hours a week, to maybe cover rent and half your food, maybe, depending on where you live. Certainly you would not be in the market to buy a home or go on vacation or see a doctor or a dentist. You know what I mean? So... You know, the middle class is now the wealthy. The wealthy are Louis XIV, you know. two-party system has to go. I mean, it just has to. Democrat convention is happening, the Democratic convention. Really, I can almost leave it at just one thing. The, I mean, everything else aside, all analysis of their platform, of the party, of uh, the candidates, just the fact that the party does not embrace Medicare for all, that one thing alone makes me go, they're worthless. They're worthless. We're in the middle of a catastrophic public health problem. And still, no, they they won't embrace that. No, there's money to be made. We can't take, there's people getting rich off your misery who contribute to our campaign. We're not going to go against that. That's just not up for debate. I mean, that footage of Joe Biden, when somebody asked him, you know, what do you think about Medicare for all? And he just laughed and he just said, get real. I mean, that's very Trumpian, very Trumpian to just go, no, I will laugh at you, at your misery at your pain, at the total dysfunction of this system. And I know that by laughing at you, I will face no consequences that matter. It won't disqualify me from being the Democratic candidate. As a matter of fact, it allows me to be the Democratic candidate. If I was, you know, Bernie Sanders, here's a thought that I had. And that I believe is very true. If you took the DNC leadership, Hillary Clinton, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, you name them, any of the big wigs, and you gave them a choice between Bernie Sanders being the president of the United States and Donald Trump being the president of the United States, regardless of what they might say publicly, you know for a fact that they would prefer Donald Trump over Bernie Sanders. You know it. You know it. And if that sounds shocking to you, you need to read more. You know. I mean, Bernie would have won in 2016 over Donald Trump. I really think he would have. I think you know he would have. They were looking for an, everybody was looking for an outsider, somebody to disrupt the system. Democrats went with the most hated candidate, nationally hated candidate, wife of Jeffrey Epstein, friend. You know what I mean? Just, just the worst. Just so bad. That that was the choice. So you know, electoral national politics. Yeah, I'll, I'll vote for Joe Biden, of course. Man, not with a smile on my face and not believing it'll change much. It'll just avert immediate catastrophe. Maybe. 
Make art, have fun, enjoy life.